Despite receiving constant criticism from stupid motorcycle YouTubers like myself, Harley has at points had a positive impact on the world a few times in its long history, and I'm not talking about Sturgis. No, for this one we need to go back, way back actually to the year 1929. This was the year that Harley introduced the DL, a 45 cubic inch civilian motorcycle made to compete with the likes of Indian Scout 101 introduced just a year earlier. The DL would evolve over time, released right before the Great Depression, this bike really carried Harley through some of its most difficult and trying years and through really massive sales drops. And it was a great motorcycle primarily because of its incredible durability and reliability. The DL was never a performance machine though like its main competitor, the Scout 101. Now this motorcycle, the 45 as it was called, would take on many forms over the years, like for example the Servi car, used in all sorts of hauling jobs, but most importantly, ice cream motorcycles. This was a motorcycle that would kind of just stick around in forms all the way into the 1970s. It was one of those motorcycles, much like a DRZ today, that just worked and kept working. And despite the more advanced knucklehead being released years before World War II would start, it was the current form of the 45 that Harley would turn to in developing a new wartime motorcycle for America and for the Allies, which was the side valve WLA. This is the motorcycle that would prove that sometimes the last of the old technology is better than the first of the new technology. Now the WL had been updated though, but again the updates were all in line with its character as really a workhorse. So Harley didn't give it, for example, higher compression like the knucklehead had. No, Harley took things that were great from the knucklehead like aluminum heads for better cooling and especially this new innovative oil recirculating system. They brought that to the 45 so that the rider no longer had to manually adjust the oil. So when World War II broke out and the contracts were being written up for Harley and for Indian, they needed to develop a motorcycle that would be able to withstand the demands of war and so they turned to the 45. Two experimental WLAs were developed and shipped off to Fort Knox, Kentucky in the fall of 1939. Interestingly enough, compression was actually lowered for these models. We'll see the advantage of that later on, it's pretty brilliant. And they cut down the fenders so that there was less mud trapping, a skid plate was added to protect the engine, and of course they were painted olive green. Now at the same time, Indian was working on their own military motorcycle in hopes of getting that army contract. I mean, these were really important times for companies like Harley-Davidson and Indian and American automotive companies because war is just not an easy time in general. The economy obviously takes a massive hit, so less people are buying motorcycles and even cars. And so this is a way to survive and make money. So Indian built their war motorcycle on the current Scout model. Now that version was significantly smaller in displacement than the WL, and the United States initially requested Harley make a smaller version of the WL, having a smaller, lighter machine would seem to have its advantages in some areas, but Harley actually refused as they believed that a more powerful, more robust motorcycle really was necessary for what the military were going to use these motorcycles for. And they really were proven right. After testing, the Army decided to go with Harley's WLA. Now, Indian and Harley were not the only players competing for the American Army contract, though. Companies like Delco, which was a division of GM, they built an advanced copy of BMW's horizontal twin with telescopic forks and shaft drive, and the Army loved it so much that Indian and Harley were actually forced to go back to the drawing board and make a bike that could withstand everything the Army was going to put it through. But the real competition was on its way in the form of four wheels, which was the Willys Overland Jeep, and that would beat out everyone in terms of performance in the worst of terrain, leaving the use of motorcycles to more limited roles in the war. So, in the most Harley of fashion, luck would make the durable and reliable and easily mass-produced WLA the standout motorcycle for what the army needed. As the war went on each year, Harley would make more and more WLAs, not just for the United States Army, but also for the Marines and eventually for Allied forces as well, and especially the Soviet Union, who in the end brought in over 27,000 WLAs for war use. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. 
Production really ramped up immediately after the attack on Pearl Harbor, when Harley was awarded a contract for just over 31,000 WLAs. Up until that point, Harley was really just producing a few thousand bikes a year for wartime use. Now many of you already know this, but wars are won not just in the trenches. The support of those efforts are often equally important. But unlike the First World War, motorcycles would play no part directly on the battlefield in World War II, and that's exactly why the WLA was so great for what was needed. I mean, technically speaking, a little dirt bike would probably be the best option for, you know, zipping around the battlefield. But at this point, vehicles like the Jeep, they were just the best on the front lines. The WLA shone over every other motorcycle during the war and was chosen by Allied troops for all the same reasons why it had made such a great, reliable civilian motorcycle. Again, it was reliable, durable, simple, and people understood it. Despite the British bikes being lighter, faster, and more nimble, and ultimately much better and easier for off-road use, the bigger, sturdier, heavier WLA was much more suited to hauling around a soldier or two soldiers fully equipped with gear and weapons. I mean, it sounds simple, but the WLA was also just more comfortable for long rides, and this is a huge reason why it became the preferred machine. I mean, it's the same reason why Jeeps were so popular during World War II, because they were just so much better than the vehicles that were being used in World War I. They were significantly more comfortable. On the other side of the battle, though, the Germans were actually developing advanced two-wheeled war machines, as we could call them. Most notably was the BMW R75 and the Zundap KS750. These were incredibly advanced motorcycles built specifically for combat, utilizing technology that had never before been seen on a motorcycle, including things like four-speed gearboxes with low and high ranges, so basically eight speeds, and then reverse with two speeds, powered sidecars, hydraulically assisted brakes, massive machine guns mounted on these sidecars, and these bikes would push close to a thousand pounds with nobody on them. But that was still considered light for a military machine. Early on, these motorcycles really did play a massive part in the German war machine, and especially in the Blitzkrieg. Having fast, lightweight, armed machine like these sidecar outfits were perfect for the horrible things Germany was trying to do. In the end, though, these kinds of advanced endeavors into making you know, high-tech machines like these sidecar motorcycles, they would be the detriment to the German efforts as they pulled massive resources and manpower just to produce these motorcycles. And when Germany found themselves completely stretched thin, simple machines like the WLA just used for getting around would have been a much better option. Now, throughout the war, the Allied forces just kept bringing in more WLAs instead of trying to copy the German combat motorcycles. And they were really just used to move their troops around efficiently. Meanwhile, the German forces were often found on horseback as they'd spent their motorcycle budget on very few of these advanced sidecar rigs. In the US, cavalry arms were slowly transitioning from horses being mechanized, and at points, they were actually partially mechanized forces. So they would be partially horse, partially motorcycle, partially four-wheeled vehicles, and it's here that Jeeps would really ultimately win out and sort of replace cavalry. Many WLAs went directly overseas with soldiers and marines to function as support vehicles, carrying military police and dispatch and messengers and even prisoners of war. Tank battalions would use motorcycles as courier and support machines as well as scouts. WLAs really did support tank battalions quite a bit throughout the war. But the absolute main use for WLAs throughout the war was military police. These units specifically needed the ability to quickly move around the roads and through the forces, whether it was for disciplinary reasons, traffic control, or just getting somewhere easily. They would provide security at bases and airfields, they would be escorts. All sorts of behind-the-scenes roles were filled by Harley's WLAs to maintain order. And that's why in war movies and old pictures, you just kind of see WLAs just kind of hanging around because they were there for people to just jump on and go do what they needed to do. One primary combat division that didn't really phase out the use of motorcycles through the war were airborne divisions with WLAs dropping in alongside small foldable scooters and even bicycles. One of the most important non-combat roles played by WLAs was in the Pacific Theater. Here, motorcycles served similar roles. Most of the combat 
happened on foot, supported by tanks, but across sprawling bases, motorcycles served military police, they became crucial machines necessary to really keep things moving in such an unfamiliar environment. Versatile machines like the WLA were so essential because if you had a smaller task that didn't call for a jeep or, you know, a tank, you found somebody on a motorcycle who could just do it a whole lot faster. Now, the one place where WLAs really did see the front lines was among the Red Battalion in the Soviet Union. More WLAs actually served the Soviet Union than the United States, and this came about after the German invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. At that time, the Soviet Union was using sidecar outfits known as the M72. Built in the Soviet Union specifically for the Red Army, this sidecar bike was essentially a BMW R71 copy. That's the same motorcycle that Harley and Indian were trying to copy in development of a military motorcycle for the US at the beginning of the war. But the Red Army was almost entirely destroyed when they were invaded, and production of the M72 was forced to move up into the Ural Mountains. Many of you will know these sidecar bikes today as Urals. I mean, Urals that are sold today are basically just old Soviet Union military motorcycles. It's still pretty much the same technology. So when it came time to rebuild the Red Army, everything was reorganized, and through a Lend-Lease program with the United States, 27,000 WLAs, along with a few thousand other motorcycles, were sent to support them in reclaiming land taken by Germany. Here, the motorcycle was a perfect fit for what the Soviet Union needed. They just attached their own Soviet-made sidecars to it, and they were off. With a rear seat and sidecar attached, three-man teams were packed into WLAs. The bike ran well on the Soviet Union's low-octane gas due to its low compression. These motorcycle battalions were lightly armed, but incredibly agile. They were able to scout ahead of the tank and infantry units, and they were absolutely essential to securing important areas in battle. Here, riders would take WLAs deep into enemy lines, leading tank operations. The difference between a WLA used by the Soviet Union and, say, a Zundapp KS-750 used by the Germans is almost analogous to why the Soviet Union was able to push the Germans back. Those specifically designed war motorcycles built by the Germans, sure, they were powerful, they were advanced, and they could do a lot of damage up front, much like the Blitzkrieg altogether, but a WLA just kind of kept going, rain or shine, or in this case in Russia, you know, cold and snow and more cold and snow, and they were the perfect fit. That simple WLA may not have been flashy or done a whole lot of damage, but it was built to run on the available low-octane gas. Like those who rode it, it just kept going and wouldn't quit, and we still see in this part of the world, that's kind of the spirit there. Throughout much of Europe, the WLA became known as the Liberator, originating in Belgium as the American forces liberated the country from Nazi occupation, with American troops riding WLAs. You and I may cringe at the sound of a wannabe Harley gang going past our house, but I'd imagine the sound of hundreds of Harleys roaring through the streets is probably a pretty comforting one after the usual sounds of war. But I would assume in part the bike also became known as the Liberator, as the Soviet Union reclaimed so much of Europe on their way all the way to Berlin, spearheaded by forces riding, again, WLAs. Much like the Jeep, after the war, many troops longed for their riding experience on the Harley-Davidson WLA, but the motorcycle itself was really at the end of its line. The military basically discarded them. They literally just chucked them in dumps. And many riders who came back moved on to newer Harley models. Most of the bikes that were sent out into the civilian world, like those who rode them, they were never the same. You know, many of them were chopped or bobbed, and sadly... Very few original WLAs are around at this point. Interestingly enough, the former Soviet Union remains one of the best places to find WLAs and to find parts for them as they continue to be used after the war. If you go to a show or a museum and you see a restored, really nice WLA, ask them. There's a good chance that the whole bike or parts from it came from Russia. But you know, this is a big reason why the WLA was so good in World War II, because it was at the end of its road. It was so much more tried and tested than anything else available. Again, the end of old technology is often better than the beginning of new technology. I'm sure I'm probably messing that quote up, but I've heard that before. But is it fair to say that the WLA won the war? The way I look at it, no single person or machine single-handedly won the war. That's just not how it works. But rather, specific people and specific machines doing exactly what they needed to do and serving how they could serve 
whether it was troops on the front line or cooks or mechanics or police or, you know, the guy pointing for the planes to go a specific way so that, you know, they don't take off in the wrong way, or the Jeep or the WLA. They all have to do their part and do it well, and that's what the WLA did. In the U.S., throughout much of the Allied forces, these motorcycles were needed for quick, easy transport, not exactly glamorous, but still important, and ultimately it was the best motorcycle for the job because they could count on it, and it was sturdy enough to handle, you know, a fully geared an armed soldier. In other places like Russia, they were absolutely essential to their counteroffensive in pushing the Germans back. I think what I love about the WLA in World War II is how much of an underdog story it was. You know, the British were producing bikes for the military also. They were on many levels better, more sophisticated motorcycles. The Germans were using, you know, super advanced motorcycle designs as full-blown combat machines. In America, Indian had more advanced motorcycles than the WLA, but still, the Allied forces chose the WLA at a rate of about 4 to 1 in comparison to other options. And why is this? Well, I think a big reason is that the WLA had just been around longer, so it was not only a more reliable, tried-and-true platform, but also people understood it. You know, overhead valve engines were a new thing at this time, the WLA was a side valve engine, but it was the absolute best side valve engine. So as foreign as a bike like this would be to us, you know, those who knew motorcycles in the military, they knew how this bike worked, they knew how to make it run best, and they knew how to maintain it and ride it. Think about the training necessary for operating and maintaining the more advanced bikes on the German side. Here we could just find some guy who, you know, rode motorcycles back home, more than likely something like a WLA, and throw him on it during the war and he's good to go. Many of us would be afraid to ride a Harley 45 to work without fear, you know, of its demise along the way, but at this time, troops who rode these bikes regularly, they knew that they could trust them in the highest of pressure situations. I mean, you can't have your bike just break down in the middle of, like, a pincer movement. And all of this goes back to Harley, in my opinion, in that moment in time when Harley needed to provide a worthy machine to get themselves that original contract with the army. Without that first success, the WLA wouldn't have gotten contracts worldwide, and this could have changed history for Harley-Davidson. If Indian had gotten all the massive contracts, it might have been a completely different story. But what's so interesting for me specifically is Harley's insistence that what the army needed was not some super advanced sidecar unit like what BMW is making or some light, fast sport bike like what the British had to offer, but rather just a strong, reliable, comfortable, rugged machine, again, that you could depend on, that was simple, basic technology. Harley had experience making motorcycles for the military going back to World War I. This wasn't their first go-around, and in that war, motorcycles actually did see active combat. They knew for this war some high-tech machine wasn't really going to be any better than just a good old motorcycle, which really was what the WL was. A good old motorcycle, like a DRZ would be today. And when you think about great military motorcycles going forward, used worldwide in great numbers, most of them have basically the same DNA as the WLA. Again, sure, there are high-tech motorcycles that can carry massive weapons, but those made little difference in war efforts. It's bikes like the KLR 650, for example, used widely during Desert Storm. That bike is really the same DNA. It's old, but it's a foolproof, reliable engine. It's a durable, rugged, but entirely simple motorcycle that you can just rely on to start no matter what the weather, no matter how the motorcycle's feeling, it's just going to start and it's going to work, and if anything goes wrong, anybody can fix it. In many ways, the WLA showed going forwards that the best motorcycle for war isn't necessarily the most advanced, it's the one that's going to start every time and that you can feel comfortable riding and that's going to be easy to fix and maintain. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed this story. I want to give a big shout out as well to this super amazing, well-researched book entirely on the Harley-Davidson WLA by Robert S. Kim. I'll put a link in the description if you guys want to check that out and maybe, you know, buy it and learn more. So thanks for watching. We'll see you guys in the next one. Ride safe.